Hello, 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 check, check. Hello, 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 check, one, two. Check, check, one, two. One, one, two, check. Hey, hey everybody. You got the sound. Hey. How are you guys? Hey, welcome, everyone. Thanks for coming. Yeah. You. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sweet. <laughs> Bring the energy. I'm a little sick, so hopefully I could have some energy. Yes. Um, and if I was shy to shake your hand, it's because I, I'm sick, but I sanitized up, so I, I think we'll be okay with that bottle back there. Yep. I found one. <laughs> so thanks for coming, yeah, everyone. Yeah, thank you, guys. Um, there's a couple people who came from Vancouver, BC. Raise your hand if you're from... Oh, there's another one. Up, BC. Two. Awesome. Yeah. Great. Anyone and, uh, else There's a gal travel? from Southern, Southern California who came up. What's that? Today? And a gal from San Diego, Liliana, I think. Yep. Right there. Hi. Yep. That's Hello. awesome. Seattle. Welcome. Yeah. You guys, thank you. Yeah. Hey, it's really great to see you. <laughs> um, the only way you're likely here uh, is because you care about and support and help spread the word about the Bible Project. Yeah. So we already like you. <laughs> <laughs> we like you a lot. Um, thank you guys so much for coming. This is really, really fun to be here with you tonight. Yeah. And tonight's going to be really great. You have a few bookkeeping things? Um, well, yeah, we just uh, we wanted to thank um, the Imago Day community, and there's a number of leaders here because um, they're letting us use the space tonight, which is awesome. Um, don't mind my kids uh, over there and all of the other kids that are yeah, here tonight. Yeah, kids too. are great. Totally great. Run. Wonderful. Um, yeah, so uh, on, on that note, just one important thing for body functions, there are bathrooms here. Only went in the foyer, women's on that side, only men's on this side. So don't do the dog, but just women over there. Um, and for uh, families, if you have kiddos and you just feel like they're not going to be able to hang here at your noise level, we're fine, but whatever. Um, there is a family room down the stairs that has like an uh, audio and uh, video there of what's happening in this room. So if your kids can't hang, they can, you can go to that room downstairs. Um, and you probably, do you guys get like tea and coffee and all this? Yeah. Okay, It's good. totally welcome in here. Feel free to drink it in the yep. sanctuary. Um, so you, pro you, you probably saw the, the tables back there. Um, but uh, if you didn't check out what's, what's going on at the tables, we're selling uh, the Revelation posters. So uh, the, the videos tonight, you know, it all ends in a poster. So we're selling those if you want to get one for 25 bucks. Or you can sign up and become a monthly donor tonight and get one for 10 bucks. signing up for uh, being a monthly donor for $10. And uh, if all you have to do is sign up on your phone and just show them your phone. This is what they told me to tell you. And uh, show them your phone saying, look, here we go. I became a monthly member. And you can get um, a poster for that. Um, there's T-shirts. Yeah. There's the Heaven and Earth Circle T-shirts. Yeah. Which are only available here. Right now, yeah. it's the only place. Yeah. <laughs> um, so there's, uh, there you go. That's what's going on at the tables. Um, yeah. And uh, there you go. Um, you guys, we're really, we're really grateful to have you here. Yeah. Also, um, there's a live stream going. Uh, oh, yes. Guy, you want to you put that up? We've got, I don't know how many people are on it. We'll find out here. Um, a lot of people, obviously, are from all over the, the world. So say hi to everyone on the live stream. Hey, everyone. 1,300 people. Awesome. Oh, there's more That's people really cool. online than let's there say, are in uh, the room right now. That's incredible. Let's see. <laughs> Darren Harris. Do you recognize anyone? I don't recognize anyone. Hey, guys. Welcome. T Toronto, London, Pol Poland, Portland. Portland, why aren't you here? <laughs> <laughs> Lazy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Come on over. Yeah. Uh, cool. So I want to tell you a little bit about um, how this all came to be. We were, Tim and I were making videos that walk through the literary structure of the Bible. We were doing them fully animated. Uh, it was taking us months to make one video. And, um, and uh, we got connected with Francis Chan, who's a, who's a speaker, author, guy. You've probably heard of him. He wrote Crazy Love. If you're familiar with him, yeah. He's a great guy. Um, Mover and Shaker. And uh, he was like excited about the project, which was awesome. Cause, yeah. Uh, and so he's like, guys, I want to use these. Can you get them all done in a year? And we were like, no, there's no, no possible way. <laughs> um, it's going to take us like 10 years is probably what it would take. Yeah. And then we went 
and we thought about it, we brainstormed, we did some research, and we came up with this idea of let's just, maybe if we made it really simple, diagrammed the book in one illustration, and then just had an animator reveal it while Tim teaches, we could get through all the books in a year. Mm -hmm. And so we tried that out. The first one was with the Book of Romans. And, uh, start easy. Right. Start with yeah. an easy one. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Nailed it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no. um, and then went from there, and that was about 18 months ago. And, and, and we produced Romans, the first Romans video uh, in about two weeks. We were able to put that out in two weeks. Yeah. And so we're like, oh, I think we can do this. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And so we went for it, and then this whole idea of Read Scripture was born. And so um, how many people have been following Read Scripture for a while and watched the videos? Awesome. Great. So we're, uh, First Peter's about to release, mm -hmm. and by the end of this year, we're going to get through everything. But tonight, you get to watch a premiere <laughs> of the Revelation, which will be out officially on December 20-something. Yes. Um, it's a two-part series. And... Um, I wanted to hear from Tim a little bit, just really quickly, like, what's it been like? Tim has done about 72 videos in 18 months, it, writing like a madman. Like, what? Give up for Tim. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, tell us a little bit about that. Um, well, yeah, with, uh, there's a much longer story to be told. Um, that we do kind of tell, we're putting all the posters and scripts for the videos into a big coffee table book um, that we're almost done designing that's going to be available next year to, um, through our website. Um, so I was already kind of thinking about the story, but a lot of the story um, begins for me as a brand new Christian in my early 20s, and um, I took classes at Multnomah uh, Bible College, now it's a university here in Portland, and uh, Ray Lubeck is a Bible professor there. And um, in his How to Read the Bible class, uh, the culminating project was called The Art of the Chart. And he would make he, you draw out the literary design of the biblical book you've been studying and do, basically it's like the videos, just more rudimentary. And so the first one I ever did was Jonah, and then second semester was Ephesians. And that's just how I learned to read and engage the Bible was by drawing it as a way of processing my way through. So I just kept doing that over the years. And as I would teach, I would just work through the books of the Bible and do that. And I had, was building up notes. And then, but I mean, that was like almost 20 years ago that I started doing that. But that's just been a habit that I've been in over the, over the last 20 years. And so this project is really the culmination of yeah. all of that work. Um, my wife is here. Oh, she just, where? Yes, right back there. Um, that's Jessica, right back there, yes. Um, she, uh, this, the 18 months after we kind of worked out with Francis, like, yeah, we're going to do this, um, she helped me plan out the writing breaks. You know, I would take three or four days to just hole up and write and draw, and she would uh, go solo with our two energetic boys <laughs> and do that. So literally, this project uh, exists because of her work to give me the, the space to work on it. So thank you, sweetie. Uh, we're really grateful for you. Um, yeah. Um, so it, uh, it's, it's, uh, we've been calling it my second PhD. <laughs> it, was, it was just a, a monster of, of work. Um, actually, and I want to, there are um, a number of the, of the illustrators and animators are here too, working with them. Uh, so Nate, Nate's here, right back here in the doors. He's been one of the primary animators for the Read Scripture videos. <laughs> um, Everett Patterson, where are you? Everett, yeah, right here. He, yeah, Everett. Um, Everett uh, illustrated uh, 50 of the posters, including the revelation you'll see tonight. He's an animal. Working with him has been a pleasure. And Matt Cooper, are you here, Mac? Mac? I don't know if he is. Mac, Mac did uh, 10 of the posters. Most, almost all Old Testament. There you go. And um, Guy did some and, animating. Yep, and Guy. He's up there running slides. Yep, hey, Guy's guy. up there running slides. You don't see him. Yeah, yeah totally. <laughs> yeah, so an incredible, incredible team for the Read Scripture Project. And um, it's just, uh, it's been an absolute privilege. I am uh, obsessed with the Bible. <laughs> yeah. I, just, yeah. Uh, I don't know any other way to, I just really Throughout drive. the entire 18 months, Tim would walk out of his, you know, zone and he would just be like, oh, the book of Titus, <laughs> or whatever he was working yeah. on, yeah. every single time, yeah. every book. Yes. He's, yeah. yeah. 
Uh, it's been, awesome. been really fun. I've learned a lot in the process, but it was, it was like a marathon. Um, and I just took time to enjoy each book and uh, turned it into a two and a half page Google Doc at 11 point font. Uh, was, was my limit. Uh, but, the t but the videos that I was really thinking about in the whole project, I fell in love with the book of Revelation from the first class that I took on it. And um, uh, the person who's going to be reciting the book of Revelation tonight, Jason Nightingale, we'll introduce in a minute. I remember the semester, I didn't tell you this, Jason, the semester that I took my first class on the Revelation, it was my first time studying it, it was in uh, the spring of 2000, and uh, there was a local church putting on an event where Jason came and recited the whole book of Revelation, uh, and that was 16 years ago. And uh, so my in introduction to studying the Revelation was connected to hearing you read it and me being in that class. So for me, these two videos tonight represent uh, a real special project for me. And um, the Revelation is so incredible. It's just so incredible in so many ways. Um, which I've said for every book of the Bible yes. so, so far. <laughs> now, <laughs> but this also, one, it really is. It's also really strange, yes, right? Yeah. Can I get an amen? It's a strange book. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, and, and it's the most asked for video ev all the time, every yes. day. When are you going to do the revelation? Yeah. So tell us a little bit about, like, what's all the hype? Yeah. Well, I mean, I, uh, I probably don't need to tell you why it's most asked for video. Um, it's because it's, uh, also one of the most controversial books of the Bible in interpretation. Um, some of uh, the best and the worst religious voices out there in public uh, love to appeal to imagery or, or uh, passages in the book of Revelation. Um, but the Revelation is unique uh, among the New Testament books, especially um, it's the most image-driven book of the Bible. Um, the author, uh, the prophet John, deals in images and symbols in the book. And he actually says that right in the opening chapters. Um, and so that's part of what makes it so intriguing is because every generation has been trying to figure out what these symbols and images mean. Um, but John uh, grew up, uh, he was a Jewish, and he grew up saturated in the Hebrew and Greek scriptures. That's what filled his, he didn't have Twitter to melt his brain. Um, he grew up on the Bible. And and so that's exactly what's happened. He's had these visions of the risen Jesus. He's had visions of what it means for God's kingdom to come on earth as in heaven. And he's given those dreams an exquisite literary form in the apocalypse of John. So we're really, really excited to let these go out into the world. And uh, it's controversial. Um, lots of different ways that people interpret the book. So in this video, more than any of the others, I stop at certain points and say, now, some people think this means this. It could mean this. Or some people think it means that. But everyone agrees that, and I just move on. Uh, and like, you know, so I'm past, it's like a stack of 20 books that I'm trying to summarize in 10 seconds. But, um, so I do that at multiple points. But uh, what I hope sinks in, both as we watch it tonight and for the people that get to watch it as it goes out, John wrote this as a pastor to uh, a network of churches, uh, some of whom were undergoing real active persecution, uh, some of whom had grown apathetic uh, in their commitment to Jesus because of the spirit of the Roman age. And so he wrote this to both comfort and shake up uh, the followers of Jesus in these churches. And that's the effect that the book is supposed to have, um, not make us think of conspiracy theories, but make us think about Jesus and his victory uh, over evil in his death and resurrection. So we're super excited uh, for uh, tonight. So here's what we're going to do. Um, uh, we are going to um, sh show the two videos, but we're going to show them in, uh, not back to back. Um, we're going to show part one, which uh, covers exactly the first half of the book, chapters one through 11. And then right after uh, the video is over, Jason Nightingale is going to come up um, and recite uh, from memory, uh, chapters 1 through 11 of the Revelation. Um, Jason Nightingale uh, has a ministry called Word Sower Ministries. Um, if you don't, never heard about him or what he does, it will be very clear to you why this is his ministry and why God's called him to this. It's a remarkable ministry of reciting whole books of the Bible in church communities all around the world. And so um, he's going to uh, recite Revelation chapters 1 through 11. Then um, we're going to pause because it's a significant 
literary break in the book. Um, we're going to give ourselves some brain space and some bladder space because <laughs> we're giving you liquid, so you might need to yeah, deal with that. So, um, but we'll have a 10-minute clock going. We'll come back. We'll watch part two, which goes from chapter 12 to the end of the book, and then Jason will get up and recite to the end. So that's simple, pretty simple layout for the evening. Yeah. We're here to both learn about the scriptures and then just hear a whole book of the Bible read aloud tonight. And I'm really stoked about that. I'm excited too. You're in for a treat. Um, so that's it. Let's I think play the that's video. That's everything we were going to say. Cool. Yeah. Thank you guys again for your support and enthusiasm and for coming. It's really good to be here with you. <laughs> The Book of the Revelation of Jesus. The author of this book, which is not called Revelations, by the way, is named at the beginning. It was written by John, which could refer to the beloved disciple who wrote the gospel and the letters of John, or it could be a different John, a messianic Jewish prophet who traveled about and taught in the early church. Whichever John it was, he makes clear in the opening paragraph what kind of book he has written. He calls it, first of all, a revelation or apocalypse. The Greek word is apokalupsis, and it refers to a type of literature very familiar to John's readers from the Hebrew scriptures and from other popular Jewish texts. Apocalypse has recounted a prophet's symbolic dreams and visions that revealed God's heavenly perspective on history and current events so that the present could be viewed in light of history's final outcome. And John says this apocalypse is a prophecy, which means it's a word from God spoken through a prophet to God's people, usually to warn or comfort them in a time of crisis. By calling this book a prophecy, John's saying that it stands in the tradition of the biblical prophets and is bringing their message to a climax. And this apocalyptic prophecy was sent to real people that John knew. The book opens and closes as a circular letter that was sent to seven churches in the ancient Roman province of Asia. Now, seven is a meaningful number for John. It's a symbol of completeness based on the seven-day Sabbath cycle in the Old Testament. And John has woven sevens into every single part of this book. Now, with this opening, John has given us clear guidance about how he wants us to understand this book. Jewish apocalypse is communicated through symbolic imagery and numbers. It is not a secret predictive code about the timing of the end of the world. Rather, John is constantly using these symbols that are drawn from the Old Testament, and he expects his readers to go discover what the symbols mean by looking up the text he's alluding to. Also, the fact that it's a letter means that John is actually addressing the situation of these first century churches. And so while this book has much to say to Christians of later generations, the book's meaning must first be anchored in the historical context of John's time, place, and audience. Which brings us into the book's first section, Jesus' message to the seven churches. John was exiled on the island of Patmos, and he saw a vision of the risen Jesus exalted as king of the world. And he was standing among seven burning lights. And John's told this is a symbol of the seven churches in Asia Minor that's been adapted from the book of the prophet Zechariah. And Jesus starts addressing the specific problems that face each church. Some were apathetic due to wealth and influence. Others were morally compromised. Their people were still eating ritual meals and sleeping around in pagan temples. But others among the churches remained faithful to Jesus, and they were suffering harassment and even violent persecution. And Jesus warns that things are going to get worse. A tribulation is upon the churches that will force them to choose between compromise or faithfulness. By John's day, the murder of Christians by the Roman Emperor Nero was passed, and the persecution of Christians by Emperor Domitian was likely underway. And so the temptation was to deny Jesus, either to avoid persecution or simply to join the spirit of the Roman age. And Jesus calls them to faithfulness so that they can overcome or literally conquer. And Jesus promises a reward for everyone in these churches who does conquer. Each reward is drawn directly from the book's final vision about the marriage of heaven and earth. And so this opening section, it sets up the main plot tension that will drive the storyline in this book. Will Jesus' people endure? Will they inherit the new world that God has in store? And why is faithfulness to Jesus described as conquering? The rest of the book is John's answer. After this, John has a vision of God's heavenly throne room, and he describes it with imagery drawn from many Old Testament prophets. Surrounding God are creatures and elders that represent all creation and human nations, and they're giving honor and allegiance to the one true creator God who is holy, holy, holy. 
In God's hand is a scroll that's closed up with seven wax seals. It symbolizes the message of the Old Testament prophets and the sealed scroll of Daniel's visions. These are all about how God's kingdom will come here fully on earth as in heaven. But it turns out no one is able to open the scroll until John hears of someone who can. It's the lion from the tribe of Judah and the root of David. He can open it. These are classic Old Testament descriptions of the messianic king who would bring God's kingdom through military conquest. Now, that's what John hears. But then what he turns and sees is not an aggressive lion king, but a sacrificed bloody lamb who's alive, standing there, and ready to open the scroll. Now, this symbol of Jesus as the slain lamb, this is crucially important for understanding the book. John's saying that the Old Testament promise of God's future victorious kingdom was inaugurated through the crucified Messiah. Jesus overcame his enemies by dying for them as the true Passover lamb so that they could be redeemed. Because of the resurrection, Jesus' death on the cross was not a defeat. It was his enthronement. It was the way he conquered evil. And so this vision concludes with the lamb alongside the one sitting on the throne. And together they are worshipped as the one true creator and redeemer. And the slain lamb begins to open the scroll. It's a symbol of his divine authority to guide history to its conclusion. Which brings us to the next section of the book, the three cycles of seven. Seven seals, seven trumpets, and seven bowls. And each cycle depicts God's kingdom and justice coming here on earth as in heaven. Now, some people think that the three sets of seven divine judgments represent a literal linear sequence of events that either happened in the past or could be happening now or are yet to happen in the future when Jesus returns. But notice how John has woven all the sevens together. So the final seven bowls come out of the seventh trumpet and the seventh seal. And the seven trumpets emerge from the seventh seal. They're like nesting dolls. Each seventh contains the next seven. Also notice how each of the series of seven culminates in the final judgment and they have matching conclusions. So it's more likely that John is using each set of seven to depict the same period of time between Jesus' resurrection and future return from three different perspectives. So the slain lamb begins to open the scroll's first four seals. And John sees four horsemen. It's an image from the book of Zechariah chapter 1. And they symbolize times of war, conquest, famine, and death. In other words, a tragically average day in human history. Then the fifth seal depicts the murdered Christian martyrs before God's heavenly throne. And the cry of their innocent blood rises up before God like smoke from the altar of incense. And they're told to rest because more Christians are yet to die. We're not told why. But we are told that it won't last forever. The sixth seal is God's ultimate response to their cry. He brings the great day of the Lord that was described in Isaiah and Joel. And the people of the earth cry out, who is able to stand? And then all of a sudden, John pauses the action with an intermission to answer that question. John sees an angel with a signet ring coming to place a mark of protection on God's servants who are enduring all this hardship. And he hears the number of those who are sealed. 144,000. It's a military census, like the one in the book of Numbers, chapter 1. There are 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes of Israel. Now, pay attention. The number of this army is what John heard, just like he heard about the conquering lion of Judah. But in both cases, what he then turned and saw was the surprising fulfillment of those military images in Jesus, the slain lamb. So when he sees this messianic army of God's kingdom, it's made up of people from all nations fulfilling God's ancient promise to Abraham. It's this multi-ethnic army of the lamb who can stand before God because they've been redeemed by the lamb's blood. And now they are called to conquer, not by killing their enemies, but by suffering and bearing witness just like the lamb. After this, the seventh and final seal is broken. But before the scroll is opened, the seven warning trumpets emerge and fire is taken from the inside sense altar. It symbolizes the cry of the martyrs and it's cast onto the earth, bringing the day of the Lord to its completion. Now, with the seven trumpets, John backs up and he retells the story again, this time with images from the Exodus story. So the first five trumpet blasts replay the plague sent upon Egypt, and then the sixth trumpet releases the four horsemen that came from the first four seals. But then John tells us that despite all these plagues, the nations did not repent, just like Pharaoh didn't in the Exodus story. So it seems that God's judgment alone will not bring people to humble repentance before him. 
Then John pauses the action again with another intermission. An angel brings the unsealed scroll that was opened by the Lamb. And just like Ezekiel, John is told to eat the scroll and then proclaim its message to the nations. Finally, the Lamb scroll is open and now we will discover how God's kingdom will come here on earth. The scroll's content is spelled out in two symbolic visions. First, John sees God's temple and the martyrs by the altar, and he's told to measure and set them apart. It's an image of protection taken from Zechariah chapter 2. But then the outer courts in the city are excluded and they get trampled down by the nations. Now, some think that this refers literally to a destruction of Jerusalem that happened in the past or will happen in the future. But more likely, John's following the tradition of Jesus and the apostles who all used the new temple as a symbol for God's new covenant people. In that case, this is an image about how Jesus' followers may suffer persecution by the nations, but this external defeat cannot take away their victory through the Lamb. This idea gets expanded in the scroll's second vision. God appoints two witnesses as prophetic representatives to the nations. And once again, some people think this refers literally to two prophets who will appear one day in the future. But John calls them lampstands, which is one of his clear symbols for the churches. So this vision is more likely about the prophetic role of Jesus' followers who are to take up the mantle of Moses and Elijah and call idolatrous nations and rulers to turn back to the one true God. But then, all of a sudden, a horrible beast appears. Let the reader remember Daniel chapter 7. And the beast conquers the witnesses and kills them. But then, God brings them back to life and vindicates the witnesses before their persecutors. And the end result is that many among the nations finally do repent and give glory to the Creator God in the day of the Lord. Now, stop. Think about the story so far. God's warning judgments through the seals and through the trumpets did not generate repentance among the nations, just like the Exodus plagues only hardened Pharaoh's heart. But the lamb, he conquered his enemies by loving them, dying for them. And now the message of the lamb's scroll reveals the mission of his army, the church. God's kingdom will be revealed when the nations see the church imitating the loving sacrifice of the lamb, not killing their enemies, but dying for them. It is God's mercy shown through Jesus' followers that will bring the nations to repentance. And this surprising claim is the message of the open scroll that John has placed at the exact center of the entire book. After this, the last trumpet sounds and the nations are shaken as God's kingdom comes here on earth as it is in heaven. So now we know how the church will bear witness to the nations and inherit the new creation, but who was that terrible beast that waged war on God's people? And how will the whole story turn out? John will tell us in the second half of the book of the Revelation. I wish I could draw that fast. <laughs> of Jesus Christ, given by God to Jesus. He made it so that he might. He made it to the testimony of Jesus Christ. Blessed is the man who reads, and blessed are those who listen to the words of this prophecy and heed what is written in it, for the hour of fulfillment is near. John, to the seven churches in the province of Asia, grace be to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, from the seven spirits before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and ruler of the kings of the earth. Now to him who loves us, and who freed us from our sins with his life's blood, who made of us a royal house, to serve as behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every shall be a I am the the Omega. God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Lord God Almighty. I, John, your brother, who share with you in the suffering and the sovereignty and the endurance which is ours in Jesus. I was on the island called Patmos because I had preached God's word and and borne my testimony to Jesus. It was on the Lord's day and I was caught up by the Spirit when behind me I heard a loud voice like the sound of a trumpet which said to me, write down what you see on a scroll and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, 
Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Well, I turned to see whose voice it was that spoke to me. And when I turned, I saw seven standing lamps of gold. And among the lamps, one like a son of man, robed down to his feet with a golden girdle round his breast. The hair of his head was white as snow white wool, and his eyes flamed like fire. His feet gleamed like burnished brass refined in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. In his right hand, he held seven stars, and out of his mouth came a sharp, two-edged sword, and his face, oh, his face shone like the sun in full strength. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead, but he laid his right hand upon me and said, do not be afraid, for I am the first and the last, and I am the living one, for I was dead, and now I am alive forevermore, and I hold the keys of death and of death's domain. Write down, therefore, what you have seen, what is now, and what shall be hereafter. Here is the secret meaning of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand, and of the seven lamps of gold. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lamps are the seven churches. To the angel of the church at Ephesus write, These are the words of the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven lamps of gold. I know all your ways your toil and fortitude. I know that you cannot endure evil men, that you have put to the proof those who claim to be apostles but are not, and have found them false. Fortitude you have. You are borne up in my cause and never flagged. But I have this matter to bring against you. You've left your early love. Think from what a height you have fallen, and repent and do as you once did. Otherwise, if you do not repent, I shall come to you and remove your lamp from its place. And yet you have this in your favor. You hate the practices of the Nicolaitans as I do. Hear, you who have ears to hear, what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who is victorious, I will grant the right to eat from the tree of life that stands in the garden of God. To the angel of the church at Smyrna write, These are the words of the first and the last who was dead and came to life again. I know how hard-pressed you are and poor, and yet you are rich. I know how you are slandered by those who claim to be Jews but are not. They are Satan's synagogue. Do not be afraid of the suffering that is to come. The devil will forsake of you into prison to put you to the test. And for ten days you will suffer cruelly. Only be faithful until death, and I will give you the crown of life. Hear, you who have ears to hear, what the Spirit says to the churches, he who is victorious cannot be harmed by the second death. To the angel of the church at Pergamum write, these are the words of the one who has the sharp two-edged sword. I know where you live. It is the place where Satan has his throne, and yet you're holding fast to my name. You did not deny your faith in me, even at the time when Antipas, my faithful witness, was killed in your city, the home of Satan. But I have these matters to bring against you. You have in Pergamum some who hold to the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to put temptation in the way of the Israelites by encouraging them to eat food sacrificed to idols and to commit fornication. In the same way also you have some who hold to the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. So repent! If you do not repent, I shall come to you soon and make war upon them with the sword which comes out of my mouth. Hear, you who have ears to hear, what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who is victorious, I will give some of the hidden manna, and I will give him also a white stone. And upon the stone shall be written a new name, known to none but him that receives it. To the angel of the church, at Thyatira write, these are the words of the Son of God, whose eyes flame like fire, and whose feet gleam like burnished brass. I know all your ways, your love and faithfulness, your fortitude and good service. And of late you have done even better than at first. But I have this matter to bring against you. You tolerate that Jezebel, the woman who claims to be a prophetess, who by her teaching lures my servants into fornication and into eating food sacrificed to idols. I have given her time to repent, but she refuses to repent of her fornication. And so I will throw her onto a bed of pain and plunge her lovers into terrible suffering unless they forswear what she is doing. And her children I will strike dead. 
This will teach all the churches that I am the searcher of men's hearts and thoughts, and that I will reward each one of you according to his deeds. And now I speak to you others in Thyatira who do not accept this teaching, and have had no experience with what they like to call the deep secrets of Satan. On you I will impose no further burden. Only hold fast what you have until I come. To him who is victorious, to him who perseveres in doing my will to the end, I will give authority over the nations, that same authority which I received from my Father, and he shall rule them with an iron rod, smashing them to bits like earth and wear. And I will give him also the star of dawn. Hear, you who have ears to hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the angel of the church at Sardis write, These are the words of the one who holds the seven spirits of God, the seven stars. I know all your ways. And though you have a name for being alive, you are dead. Wake up and put some strength into what is left, which must otherwise die, for I have not found any work of yours completed in the eyes of my God. Remember the teaching you received. Observe it and repent. If you do not wake up, I shall come upon you like a thief, and you will not know the moment of my coming. Yet you have a few persons in Sardis who have not polluted their clothing. They shall walk with me in white, for so they deserve. He who is victorious shall thus be robed all in white. His name I will never strike off the roll of the living, for in the presence of my Father and his angels, I will acknowledge him as mine. Hear, you who have ears to hear, what the Spirit says to the churches. To the angel of the church at Philadelphia write, these are the words of the Holy One, the true one who holds the key of David. When he opens, none may shut. When he shuts, none may open. I know all your ways and look, I have set before you an open door which no one can shut. Your strength I know is small, yet you have observed my commands and not disowned my name. This what I will do. I'll make those of Satan's synagogue who claim to be Jews but are lying frauds come and fall down at your feet and they will know that you are my beloved people. Because you have kept my command and stood fast, I will also keep you from the ordeal that is coming to fall upon the whole world and test its inhabitants. I am coming soon, so hold fast what you have and let no one rob you of your crown. To him who is victorious, I'll make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall never leave it. And I shall write the name of my God upon him and the name of the city of my God, that new Jerusalem which is coming down out of heaven from my God, and my own new name. Hear, you who have ears to hear what the Spirit says to the churches, to the angel of the church at Laodicea write. These are the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the prime source of all God's creation. I know all your ways that you are neither hot nor cold. Oh, how I wish you were either hot or cold, but because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. You see how rich I am and how well I have done. I have everything I want in the world, when in fact, though you do not know it, you are the most pitiful wretch, poor, blind, and naked. So I advise you to buy from me gold, refined in the fire, to make you truly rich, and white clothes to put on to hide the shame of your nakedness, and ointment for your eyes so that you may see all whom I love I reprove and discipline. Be on your mettle, therefore, and repent. Here I stand knocking at the door. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and sit down to supper with him and he with me. To him who is victorious, I will grant a place on my throne as I myself was victorious and sat down with my father on his throne. Hear, you who have ears to hear what the Spirit says to the churches. After this, I looked, I saw a door open in heaven, and the voice I had first heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here, and I will show you what must happen hereafter. At once I was caught up by the Spirit, and there in heaven stood a throne. And upon the throne sat one whose appearance was like the gleam of, of jasper and cornelian, and round the throne was a rainbow 
bright as an emerald. In a circle about this throne stood 24 other thrones, and upon them sat 24 elders, robed in white and wearing crowns of gold. From the throne went out flashes of lightning and peals of thunder, and burning before the throne were seven flaming torches, the seven spirits of God, and in front of it stretched what seemed a sea of glass, like a sheet of ice. In the center round the throne itself stood four living creatures covered with eyes in front and behind. The first creature was like a lion, the second like an ox, the third had a human face, and the fourth like an eagle in flight. The four living creatures, each of them had six wings, had eyes all over inside and out. And by day and by night without pause they sang, Holy, holy, holy is God, the Lord God Almighty, who is and who was and who is to come. As often as the four living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to the one who sits on the throne who lives forever and ever. The 24 elders fall down before the one who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. And as they lay their crowns before the throne, they cry, Thou art worthy, O Lord our God, to receive all glory and honor and power because thou didst create all things. By thy will they were created and have their being. And after this I looked, I saw on the right hand of the one who sat on the throne a scroll with writing inside and out, and it was sealed up with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and to break its seven seals? And there was no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth who was able to open the scroll or to look inside it. I wept and wept because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll or to look inside it. But one of the elders turned to me and said, Do not weep, for the lion from the tribe of Judah, the sky of David, has won the right to open the scroll and to break its seven seals. And I saw standing in the very middle of the throne, inside the circle of living creatures and the circle of elders, a lamb with the marks of slaughter upon him. He had seven horns and seven eyes. The eyes which are the seven spirits of God sent out over all the earth. And the lamb went up and took the scroll from the right hand of the one who sat on the throne. And when he took it, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb. Each of the elders had a harp and they held golden bowls full of incense, the prayers of God's people. And they were singing a new song. Thou art worthy to take the scroll and to break its seals for thou wast slain and by thy blood didst purchase for God men of every tribe and land language, people, and nation, and thou hast made of them a royal house to serve our God as priests, and they shall reign upon earth. Then I heard the voices of countless angels. These were all around the throne, the living creatures and the elders, myriads upon myriads. There were thousands upon thousands, and they cried aloud, worthy is the lamb, the lamb that was slain, to receive all power and wealth, wisdom and might, honor and glory and praise. Then I heard every created thing in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea, all that is in them crying, praise and honor, glory and might be to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshiped. And I watched as the Lamb broke the first of the seven seals. And I heard one of the four living creatures say in a voice like thunder, Come! And there's a look was a white horse. And its rider held a bow. He was given a crown and he rode forth conquering and to conquer. When the lamb broke the second seal, I heard the second living creature say, Come! And out came another horse, all red. To its rider was given power to take peace in the earth and to make men slaughter one another. And he was given a great sword. When he broke the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come! And out came another horse, all black. And its rider held in his hand a pair of scales. And I heard what sounded like a voice from the midst of the living creatures which said, A whole day's wage for a quart of flour, a whole day's wage for three quarts of barley meal, but spare the olive and the vine. And we broke the fourth seal. I heard the fourth living creature say, Come! And there as I looked was another horse, sickly pale, and its rider's name was Death. And Hades followed close behind. To him was given authority over a quarter of the earth, with the right to kill by sword and by famine, by pestilence and wild beasts. And I watched, he broke the fifth seal, and I saw at the foot of the altar the souls of all those who had been slaughtered for God's word and for the testimony they bore. And they gave a great cry. How long, sovereign Lord, holy and true, must it be before thou wilt vindicate us and avenge our blood upon the inhabitants of the earth? Each of them was given a white robe, and they were told to rest a little while longer until the tally should be complete of all their brothers in Christ's service who were to be killed 
as they had been. And then I watched, he broke the sixth seal, and there was a violent earthquake, and the sun turned black as a funeral pall, and the moon all red as blood. The stars in the sky fell to the earth like figs shaken down by a gale, and the sky vanished as the scroll is rolled up, and every mountain and island was moved from its place. And the kings of the earth, magnets and marshals, the rich and powerful, and all men slave and free, hid themselves in caves and mountain crags, and they cried out to the mountains and the crags, fall on us, and hide us in the face of the one who sits on the throne and from the vengeance of the Lamb for the great day of their vengeance is come and who who will be able to stand and after this I saw four angels stationed at the four corners of the earth holding back the four winds so that no wind should blow on sea or land or in any tree then I saw another angel rising out of the east carrying the seal of the living God. And he called aloud to the four angels who had been given power to ravage land and sea, do no damage to see or land or trees until we have set the seal of our God upon the foreheads of his servants. And I heard the number of those who received the seal. From all the tribes of Israel, there were 144,000, 12,000 from the tribe of Judah, 12,000 from the tribe of Reuben, 12,000 from the tribe of Gad, and 12,000 from the tribe of Asher, 12,000 from the tribe of Naphtali, 12,000 from the tribe of Manasseh, 12,000 from the tribe of Simeon, 12,000 from the tribe of Levi, 12,000 from the tribe of Issachar, 12,000 from the tribe of Zebulun, 12,000 from the tribe of Joseph, and 12,000 from the tribe of Benjamin. And after this, I looked, I saw a vast throng which no one could count, from every nation and tribe, language and people, standing in front of the throne and before the Lamb. They were robed in white and held palms in their hands, and they shouted to God together, Victory to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb! And all the angels stood around the throne and the living creatures and the elders, and they fell on their faces and worshiped God, saying, Amen! Praise and glory and wisdom! Thanksgiving, honor, honor, power, and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders turned to me and said, These men that are robed in white, who are they and from where do they come? But I answered, My Lord, you know not I. Then he said to me, These are the men that have come out of the great ordeal. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. And that is why they stand before the throne of God and minister to him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will dwell with them. They shall never again feel hunger or thirst. The sun shall not beat on them nor any scorching heat. For the lamb who is at the heart of the throne will be their shepherd. And he shall guide them to the springs of the water of life. And God will wipe all tears from their eyes. Now when the angel broke the seventh seal, there was silence seven in heaven for what seemed half an hour. And the seven angels that stood in the presence of God were given seven trumpets. And another angel came and stood before the altar with the golden censer. He was given a great quantity of incense to offer the prayers of all God's people upon the golden altar that stood before the throne. And from the angel's hand, the smoke of the incense went up before God with the prayers of his people. And the angel took the censer, filled it from the altar fire, and threw it down upon the earth. There came flashes of lightning, appeals of thunder, and an earthquake. And the seven angels that held the seven trumpets prepared to blow them. So the first angel blew his trumpet, and there came fire and hail mingled with blood, and this was hurled upon the earth. And a third of the earth was burnt. A third of the trees were burnt. All the green grass was burnt. And the second angel blew his trumpet, and what looked like a great blazing mountain was hurled into the sea. And a third of the sea was turned to blood, and a third of the living creatures in it died. And a third of the ships on it foundered. And the third angel blew his trumpet, and a great star shot from the sky, flaming like a torch. And it fell on a third of the rivers and the springs. And the name of the star was Wormwood, and a third of the water was turned to Wormwood. And men in great numbers died of the water, because it had been poisoned. And the fourth angel blew his trumpet, and a third part of the sun was struck, and a third of the moon, and a third of the stars. So a third of their light went dark. And a third of the light of the day failed and of the night. And then I saw an eagle calling with a loud cry as it flew in mid-heaven. Whoa! Whoa! 
Woe to the inhabitants of the earth when the trumpets sound, which the three last angels must now blow. And the fifth angel blew his trumpet. And I saw a star that had fallen from heaven to earth. And the star was given the key of the shaft of the abyss. And with this, he opened the shaft of the abyss. And from the shaft, smoke rose like smoke from a great furnace. And the sun and the air were darkened by the smoke from the shaft. Then over the earth, out of the smoke, came locusts. These were given the powers that earthly scorpions have. They were told to do no injury to the grass or to any plant or tree, but only to those men who had not received the seal of God upon their foreheads. These they were allowed to torment for five months with a torment like a scorpion sting, but they were not to kill them. During that time, these men will seek death, but they will not find it. They will long to die. But death will elude them. In appearance, the locusts were like horses equipped for battle. They had on their heads what looked like golden crowns. Their faces were like human faces, their hair like women's hair. They had teeth like lion's teeth and wore breastplates like iron. And the sound of their wings was like the sound of horses and chariots rushing to battle. They had tails like scorpions with stings in them. And in their tails lay their power to plague mankind for five months. And they have with their king, the angel of the abyss, whose name in Hebrew is Abaddon, and in Greek, Apollyon, or the destroyer. First woe has now passed, but there are still two more to come. And the sixth angel blew his trumpet, and I heard a voice from between the horns of the golden altar that stood before the throne, and it said to the angel that held the trumpet, Release the four angels held bound at the great river Euphrates. So the four angels were let loose to kill a third of mankind. They had been held ready for this moment, for this very year and month, day and hour, and their squadrons of cavalry, count I heard, numbered 200 million. This is how the horses and their riders looked in my vision. They wore breastplates, fiery red, blue, and sulfur yellow. The horses' heads were like lion's heads, and from their, their mouths came fire, smoke, and sulfur. By these three plagues, that is by the fire, the smoke, and the sulfur that came from the horses' mouths, a third of mankind was killed. The power of the horses lay in their mouths and in their tails also, for their tails were like snakes with heads, and with these two they dealt injuries. The rest of mankind who survived these plagues still did not renounce the gods their hands had fashioned, nor cease their worship of devils, nor of idols made of gold, silver, bronze, stone, and wood, which cannot see, or hear, or walk, nor did they repent of their murders, their fornication, their sorcery, or their robberies. And after this, I looked, I saw another mighty angel coming down out of heaven from God. He was wrapped in cloud with a rainbow around his head. His face shone like the sun, and his legs were like pillars of fire. And in his hand, he held a little scroll unrolled. His right foot he placed in the sea, his left on the land. Then he gave a great shout, like the roar of a lion. And when he shouted, the seven thunders spoke. I was about to write down what the seven thunders had said, but I heard a voice speaking to me from heaven, which said, seal up with the seven thunders of said, do not write it down. Then the angel that I saw standing in the sea and the land raised his right hand to heaven and swore by him who lives, who created heaven and earth, the sea and everything in them, there shall be no more delay. For when the time comes for the seventh angel to sound his trumpet, the hidden purpose of God will have been fulfilled as he promised to his servants, the prophets. And then the voice that first heard speaking to me from heaven was speaking again and said, Now go and take the open scroll from the hand of the angel that stands in the sea and the land. So I went to the angel and I asked him to give me the little scroll. He said, Take it and eat it. It'll turn your stomach sour, although in your mouth it will taste sweet as honey. So I took the scroll from the angel and I ate it. And in my mouth it did taste sweet as honey, but when I swallowed it, turned my stomach sour. And then they said to me, once again, you must utter prophecies over peoples and nations and languages and many kings. I was given a long cane and told, now go and measure the temple of God, the altar and the number of worshipers, but have nothing to do with the outer court of the temple. Do not measure that. But it has been given over to the Gentiles and they shall trample the holy city underfoot for 42 months. And I have two witnesses whom I will appoint to prophesy dressed in sackcloth all through those 1260 days. These are the two olive trees and the two lamps that stand in the presence of the Lord of the earth. If anyone seeks to do them harm, fire pours in their mouths and consumes their enemies, and thus shall the man die who seeks to do them injury. These two have been given the power to shut up the sky so that no rain may fall during the time of their prophesy, and they have the power to turn water to blood and to strike the earth at will with every kind of plague. But when they have completed their testimony, the beast which comes up from the abyss will wage war upon them and defeat and kill them. 
Their corpses will lie in the street of the great city, whose name and allegory is Sodom or Egypt, where also their Lord was crucified. For three days and a half, men from every nation, of all tribes, languages, and peoples, gaze upon their corpses and refuse them burial. All men on earth gloat over them, make merry, and exchange presents, for these two prophets were a torment to the whole earth. But at the end of the three days and a half, the breath of life from God came into them, and they stood up on their feet, to the terror of all who saw it. Then a voice was heard, speaking to them from heaven, which said, come up here. And they went up to heaven in a cloud in full view of their enemies. At that very moment, there was a violent earthquake and a tenth of the city fell. 7,000 people died in that earthquake. The rest in terror paid homage to the God of heaven. The second woe has now passed, but the third is soon to come. And the seventh angel blew his trumpet, and there were voices heard in heaven shouting, The sovereignty of the world has passed to our Lord and his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. And the 24 elders, seated on their thrones before God, fell on their faces and worshipped God, saying, We give thee thanks, O Lord God, Lord God Almighty, who art and who wast, for thou hast taken thy great power into thy hands and entered upon thy reign. The nations raged, but thy day of retribution has come. Now is the time for the dead to be judged. Now is the time for recompense to thy servants, the prophets, to thy dedicated people, and to all who honor thy name, both great and small. The time to destroy those who destroy the earth. Then God's temple in heaven was laid open, and within the temple could be seen the ark of his covenant. And there came flashes of lightning, peals of thunder, an earthquake, and a storm of hail. And so ends the first 11 chapters. I got it. Thank you. <laughs> Praise God. Yeah. All right. We're still going. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to do a 10 minute break. And there'll be a countdown clock so you can be in your seats. And we're going to then start the second half of the Revelation. There's coffee and tea and cider, women's bathrooms, men's bathrooms. And we'll see you back in 10 minutes. Thanks, guys.
All right. Thanks again uh, for coming, you guys. I don't know if you uh, caught in the opening paragraph of the Revelation, um, but uh, there's a blessing pronounced on the one who reads this book and a blessing on those who hear it. Did you catch that at the beginning? Um, John designed this book for the very experience that we're having this evening. Um, He designed the book to be read aloud at one go. But modern Westerners, we're brain fried, and so we have to have a 10-minute you know, intermission. But uh, the book was designed for the very thing that we're experiencing here tonight. And uh, I don't know if you've ever heard a whole book of the Bible read aloud. Um, that's how uh, most of the earliest followers of Jesus uh, experienced the Bible uh, for centuries, uh, was through hearing whole sections or whole books of the Bible read aloud. So this is really... Uh, a privilege to get to experience something that puts us in touch with thousands of years of a heritage and practice in, in, the, in the church. So um, with no further delay, you guys ready for action? So the, uh, the Lamb Scroll has been opened. How many of you have ever noticed that kind of narrative arc to the book before? I think the images can so overwhelm you. There's a story being told about the persecuted uh, church that's shaken awake and that's given comfort through the message of the Lamb's Scroll that calls uh, God's people to this strange vocation of suffering love before the nations. Um, so who, who is the beast? And what will happen uh, when the beast and the kingdom of God collide? This is the second half of the book of Revelation. So let's uh, watch the video, and then again, Jason uh, will read for us uh, the last half of the book. The revelation of Jesus given to John the prophet. In the first video, we explored how John composed this apocalyptic prophecy as a circular letter to seven churches in Asia Minor to challenge and comfort these Christians who were suffering from apathy and persecution under the Roman Empire. We also encountered John's main symbol for Jesus, the slain lamb, who conquered his enemies by dying for them. He is the one who opens up the scroll containing God's purposes to bring his kingdom on earth as in heaven. The scroll's opening brought warning judgments like the plagues of Egypt, and like Pharaoh, the nations do not repent. And then John introduced the multi-ethnic army of the Lamb, and the open scroll revealed their strange mission. It's to follow the Lamb by bearing witness to God's justice and mercy before the beastly nations, even if it kills them. And they will conquer the beast by laying down their lives just like the Lamb, and this will move the nations to repentance. In the remainder of the book, John will fill out his portrayal of this beast and his war on God's people and how the whole story ends. After the seven trumpets, John stops the drumbeat of sevens with a series of visions that he calls signs. The word literally means symbols, and these chapters are full of them. These visions explore the message of the open scroll in greater depth. The first one reveals the cosmic spiritual battle that lay behind the suffering of the seven churches under Roman persecution. It's a manifestation of that ancient conflict that began in Genesis chapter 3. The serpent, who represents the source of all evil, is depicted here as a dragon. It attacks a woman and her seed. They represent the Messiah and his people. Then the Messiah defeats the dragon through his death and resurrection, and it's cast to earth. There the dragon inspires hatred and persecution of the Messiah's people but they will conquer the dragon by resisting his influence, even if it kills them. John's trying to show the churches that neither Rome nor any other nation or human is the real enemy. There are dark spiritual powers at work, and Jesus' followers will announce Jesus' victory by remaining faithful and loving their enemies just like the slain lamb. John's next vision retells the story of the same conflict, but this time in the earthly symbolism of Daniel's animal visions. John sees two beasts empowered by the dragon. One of them represents national military power that conquers through violence. The other beast symbolizes the economic propaganda machine that exalts this power as divine. 
And these bees demand full allegiance from the nations, and that's symbolized by taking the mark of the beast and his number, 666, on the forehead or hand. Now, this is an infamous image, and you won't discover its meaning by reading news headlines. John's making a clear Hebrew Old Testament reference here. First of all, this mark is the anti-Shema. The writing on the forehead and hand, it's a clear reference to the Shema, an ancient Jewish prayer of allegiance to God that's found in the book of Deuteronomy. This prayer also was written on the forehead and hand as a symbol of devoting all your thoughts and actions to the one true God. But now the rebellious nations demand their own allegiance and they force everyone to decide who they will follow. Then there's the number of the beast, which has fascinated readers for thousands of years. But this was not a mystery to John. He spoke Hebrew and Greek, and Hebrew letters were also numbers. If you spell the Greek words Nero Caesar and the word beast in Hebrew, each one amounts to 666. Now, John isn't saying that Nero was the only fulfillment of this vision. Nero is just a recent example of the ancient pattern set out by Daniel that the nations become beasts when they exalt their own power and economic security as a false god and then demand total allegiance. So Babylon was the beast in Daniel's day, but that was followed by Persia, followed by Greece, and now Rome in John's day. And so it goes for any later nation that acts in the same way. Standing opposed to the beastly nations and the dragon is another king. It's the slain lamb. He's with his army who have given their lives to follow him. And from the new Jerusalem, their song of victory goes out to the nations in what John calls the eternal gospel. And they call everyone to repent and to worship God and to come out of Babylon that will fall. Its days are numbered. Then John sees a vision of final judgment. It's symbolized by two harvests. One is a good harvest of grain as King Jesus comes to gather up his faithful people to himself. The other is a harvest of wine grapes. It represents humanity's intoxication with evil. They're taken to the wine press and trampled. Now, throughout all these sign visions, John is placing a stark choice before the seven churches. Will they resist the lure of Babylon and follow the lamb? Or will they follow the beast and suffer its defeat. Now that the choice is clear, John replays a final cycle of seven divine judgments, symbolized as pouring out seven bowls. Now we know from the Lamb's scroll and from the sign visions that many among the nations do repent. But as the Exodus plagues are repeated and poured out through the bowls, there are many people who do not repent. They resist and curse God just like Pharaoh. And so it all leads up to the sixth bowl. As the dragon and the beasts, they gather the nations together to make war against God's people in a place called Armageddon. This refers to a plain in northern Israel where many battles were fought by Israel against invading nations. And some people think that this sixth bowl refers to an actual future battle. Other people think that it's a metaphor for God's final justice on evil. Either way, John's clearly taken images from the book of Ezekiel about God's battle with Gog. Gog was Ezekiel's symbol of the rebellious nations gathered before God to face his justice. And that's what comes in the seventh bowl. It's the fourth and final depiction of the day of the Lord when evil is defeated among the nations once and for all. Now, John has fully unpacked the message of the Lamb's unsealed scroll. And now he goes back to expand on three key themes that he's introduced earlier. The fall of Babylon, the final battle to defeat evil, and the arrival of the new Jerusalem. And each one of these explores the final coming of God's kingdom from a different angle. So first, the fall of Babylon. An angel shows John a stunning woman who's dressed like a queen, but she's drunk with the blood of the martyrs and of all innocent people. She's riding the dragon beast from the sign visions. It's a symbol of the rebellious nations. And she's called Babylon, the prostitute. Now, the detailed symbols of this vision, they would be very clear to John's first readers. He's personifying the military and economic power of the Roman Empire, but he's also doing more. In this vision, John has blended together words and images from every single Old Testament passage about the downfall of ancient Babylon, Tyre, and Edom. John's showing how Rome is simply the newest version of the Old Testament archetype of humanity in rebellion against God. They come together and form nations that exalt their own economic and military security into a false God. This isn't something limited to the past, or the future. It's a portrait of the human condition throughout history. And Babylon's will come and go leading up to the day when Jesus returns to replace Babylon with his kingdom. But how will Jesus' kingdom come? 
Up to this point, the day of the Lord has been depicted as a day of fire or earthquake or harvest, and now it's depicted as a final battle, and it's told twice. It results in the vindication of the martyrs. Now John takes us back to the sixth bowl, where the nations were gathered together to oppose God. And all of a sudden, Jesus appears. He's the great hero. He's the word of God riding on a white horse, and he's ready to conquer the world's evil. But pay attention. He's covered with blood before the battle even begins, and that's because it's his own. And his only weapon is the sword of his mouth. It's an image adapted from Isaiah. John's telling us that Armageddon will not be a bloodbath. Rather, the same Jesus who shed his own blood for his enemies now comes proclaiming justice. He will hold accountable those who refuse to repent of the ways that they participate in the ruin of God's good world. And the destructive hellfire that they've unleashed in God's world justly becomes their own God-appointed destiny. After this, John sees a vision of Jesus' followers who have been murdered by Babylon, and they're brought back to life, and they reign with the Messiah for 1,000 years. Then after this, the dragon who inspired humanity's rebellion against God rallies the nations of the world together to rebel against God's kingdom. But before God's throne of justice, they all face the consequences of eternal defeat. And so the forces of spiritual evil and everyone who doesn't want to participate in God's kingdom are destroyed. They're given what they want to exist by themselves and for themselves. And so the dragon and Babylon and all who choose them are eternally quarantined, never again able to corrupt God's new creation. Now, there's a lot of debate about the relationship of the 1,000 years to these two battles. There are some who think it refers to a literal chronological sequence. Jesus' return, followed by a thousand-year kingdom on earth called the millennium, followed by God's final judgment. Other people think that the thousand years are a symbol of Jesus' and the martyrs' present victory over spiritual evil, and that the two battles depict Jesus' future return from two different angles. Whichever view you take, the main point is clear. When Jesus returns as king, he will deal with evil forever, and he'll vindicate those who have been faithful to him. The book concludes with a final vision of the marriage of heaven and earth. An angel shows John a stunning bride that symbolizes the new creation that has come forever to join God and his covenant people. God announces that he's come to live with humanity forever and that he's making all things new. John's vision here is a kaleidoscope of Old Testament promises. This place is a new heavens and earth, a restored creation that's healed of the pain and evil of human history. It's also a new garden of Eden, the paradise of eternal life with God. But it's not simply a return back to the garden. It's a step forward into a new Jerusalem, a great city where human cultures and all their diversity work together in peace and harmony before God. And in the most surprising twist of all, there's no temple building in the new creation because the presence of God and the Lamb that were once limited to the temple now permeate every square inch of the new world. And there's a new humanity there fulfilling the calling placed on them all the way back on page one of the Bible to rule as God's image, to partner together with God in taking this creation into new and uncharted territory. And so ends John's apocalypse and the epic storyline of the whole Bible. John did not write this book as a secret code for you to decipher the timetable of Jesus' return. It's a symbolic vision that brought hope and challenge to the seven first century churches and every generation of Christians since. It reveals history's pattern and God's promise that every human kingdom eventually becomes Babylon and must be resisted in the power of the slain lamb. But there's a promise that Jesus, who loved and died for this world, will not let Babylon go unchecked. He will return one day to remove evil from his good world and make all things new. And that is a promise that should motivate faithfulness in every generation of God's people until the king returns. That's what the book of Revelation is all about. Good job. Praise God. Then God's temple in heaven was laid open. And within the temple could be seen the ark of his covenant. And there came flashes of lightning and peals of thunder and an earthquake and a storm of hail. Next appeared a great portent in heaven, a woman robed with the sun, beneath her feet the moon, and on her head a crown of twelve stars. She was pregnant 
and in the anguish of her labor she cried out to be delivered. Then a second portent appeared in heaven, a great red dragon with seven heads and ten horns. On its heads were seven diadems, and with his tail he swept down a third of the stars from the sky and flung, flung them to the earth. The dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth, so that when her child was born he might devour it. She gave birth to a male child who was destined to rule all nations with an iron rod, but her child was snatched up to God in his throne, and the woman herself fled into the wilds, so for she had a place prepared for her by God, there to be sustained for 1260 days. Then war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels waged war upon the dragon. The dragon and his angels fought, but they had not the strength to win, and no foothold was left them in heaven. So the great red dragon was thrown down, that serpent of old, who led the whole world astray, whose name is Satan or the devil, thrown down to the earth and his angels with him. Then I heard a voice from heaven proclaiming aloud, this is the hour of victory for our God. The hour of his sovereignty and power, when his Christ enters upon his rightful rule. For the accuser of our brothers is overthrown, who day and night accuse him before our God. By the sacrifice of the Lamb they have conquered him, and by the testimony which they uttered. For they did not hold their lives too dear to lay them down. Rejoice in you heavens, and you that dwell in them. But woe to you earth and sea, for the devil has come down to you in great fury, knowing that his time is short. Oh, when the dragon found that he had been thrown down to the earth, he went off in pursuit of the woman who had given birth to the male child. But the woman was given two great eagle wings to fly to the place in the wilds where for three years and a half she was to be sustained out of the serpent's reach. From its mouth the serpent spewed a flood of water after the woman to sweep her away with its spate. But the earth came to her rescue and opened its mouth and swallowed the river which the dragon had spewed from its mouth. At this the dragon grew furious with the woman and went off to wage war on the rest of her offspring, that as on those who keep God's commandments and maintain their testimony to Jesus, he took his stand on the seashore. Then out of the sea I saw a beast rising. He had ten horns and seven heads. On its horns were ten diadems, and on each head a blasphemous name. The beast I saw were like a leopard's, but its feet were like a bear's, and its mouth like a lion's mouth. The dragon conferred upon it his power and rule and great authority. One of its head appeared to have received a death blow, but the mortal wound was healed. The whole world went after the beast in wandering or admiration. Men worshipped the dragon because he had conferred his authority upon the beast. Men worshiped the beast also and chanted, who is like the beast? Who can fight against him? The beast was allowed to mouth bombast and blasphemy and was given the right to reign for 42 months. He opened his mouth and blasphemy against God, reviling his name and his heavenly dwelling. He was allowed to wage war upon God's people and to defeat them and was given authority over every nation and tribe, language and people. All on earth will worship the beast except those whose names the lamb that was slain keeps in his role of the living written there since the world was made. Hear, you who have ears to hear, whoever's to be made a prisoner, a prisoner he shall be. Whoever takes the sword to kill, by the sword he is bound to be killed. This is where the fortitude and faithfulness of God's people has its place. Then after I looked, I saw another beast which came up out of the earth. He had two horns like a lamb, but spoke like a dragon. He wielded all the authority of the first beast in its presence and gave the earth and its inhabitants and made the earth and its inhabitants worship the beast who had been wounded by the sword and yet lived. He was allowed to work great miracles, even making fire come down from heaven to earth before men's eyes. And by the miracles he was allowed to perform in the presence of the beast, he deluded the inhabitants of the earth and made them erect an image in honor of the beast who had been wounded by the sword and yet lived. He was allowed to give breath to the image so that it could speak and could cause all who would not worship it to be put to death. Moreover, he caused all men, great and small, rich and poor, slave and free, to be branded with a mark on his right hand or forehead, and no one was allowed to buy or sell unless he bore this beast's mark, either name or number. Here is the key, and anyone who has intelligence may work out the number of the beast. The number represents a man's name, and the numerical value of its letters is 666. And then I looked, and on Mount Zion stood the Lamb, 
And with him were 144,000 who had his name and the name of his father and their foreheads. And I heard a sound from heaven like the noise of rushing water and the deep roar of thunder it was the sound of harpers playing on their harps. There before the throne and the living creatures and the elders, they were singing a new song, that song which no one could learn except these 144,000 who alone from the whole world had been ransomed. These are men who did not defile themselves with women, for they have kept themselves chaste, and they follow the Lamb wherever he goes. They have been ransomed as the first fruits of humanity for God and the Lamb. No lie was found in their lips. They are faultless. Then I saw an angel flying in mid heaven with an eternal gospel to proclaim to those on earth, to every nation and tribe, language and people. And he cried out loud, fear God and pay him homage. For the hour of his judgment is near. Worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the water springs. And another angel, a second followed, and he cried out, Fallen! Fallen is Babylon the great. She who has made all nations drink the fierce wine of her fornication. And yet another angel, a third, followed, and he cried out loud, Whoever worships the beast in its image and receives its mark on right hand or forehead, he shall drink the wine of God's wrath poured undiluted into the cup of his vengeance. He shall be tormented in sulfurous flames before the holy angels and the Lamb, and the smoke of their torment shall rise forever and ever. And there will be no respite for those who worship the beast in its image and who wear the mark of the beast. This is where the fortitude of God's people has its place in keeping God's commands and remaining loyal to Jesus. Moreover, I heard a voice speaking to me from heaven which said, write this, blessed are the dead who die in the faith of Christ. Henceforth, says the spirit, they may rest from their labors for they take with them the record of their deeds. And after this, I looked, a white cloud appeared, and upon the cloud sat one like a son of man. In his hand he held a gold sickle, and on his head was a golden crown. And from the, angel, from the temple came another angel, and he shouted in a loud voice to him who had this, the sharp sickle, Stretch out your sickle, and gather and nurse grape harvest, for its clusters are overripe. So the angel put his sickle to the earth and gathered in its harvest. And from the temple came another angel, and he also had a sharp sickle. And then from the altar came yet another, the angel who has authority over fire. And he shouted in a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, Stretch out your sickle and gather in earth's grape harvest, for its clusters are ripe. So the angel put his sickle to the earth and gathered in earth's grape harvest and threw it into the great winepress of God's wrath. And the winepress was trodden outside the city, and for 200 miles around, the blood flowed from the from the, height, from the wine press to the height of the horse's bridles. Next, another great and astonishing portent appeared in heaven. Seven angels with seven plagues, the last plagues of all, for with them the wrath of God is consummated. And I saw what seemed a sea of glass shot with fire, and beside the sea holding the harps that God had given them were those men who had won the victory over the beast in its image and the number of its name. They were singing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb as they chanted, Great and marvelous are thy deeds, O Lord God, sovereign over all, true and just to thy judgments, thou king of the ages. Who shall not revere thee, Lord, and pay homage to thy name? For thou alone art holy. All nations shall come and worship in thy presence, for thy just dealings stand revealed. And in the sanctuary, the heavenly tent of testimony was thrown open, and out of it came the seven angels with the seven plagues. They were clothed in fine linen, clean and shining, and had golden girdles round their breast. Then one of the four living creatures gave the seven angels seven golden bowls full of the wrath of God who lives forever and ever. And the sanctuary was filled with smoke from the glory of God and his power so that no one could enter it until the seven plagues of the seven angels were completed. And then from the sanctuary I heard a loud voice which said to the seven angels, now go and pour out the seven bowls of God's wrath upon the earth. So the first angel went and poured his bowl upon the earth. And foul, malignant sores appeared upon those men who worshipped the beast in its image and who wore the mark of the beast. And the second angel poured his bowl on the sea, and its water was turned to blood like the blood from a corpse. And every living thing in the sea died. And the third angel poured his bowl on the rivers and the springs, and they too were turned to blood. Then I heard the angel of the waters say, Just art thou in these thy judgments, thou holy one, who art and who wast, 
For they shed the blood of thy prophets and of thy people, and thou hast given them blood to drink. They have their desserts, and I heard the altar cry, Yes, Lord God, sovereign over all, true and just of thy judgments. And the fourth angel poured his bowl on the sun. It was allowed to burn men with its flames. They were fearfully burned, but they only cursed the God of heaven for their sores and pains, and they would not repent or do him homage. And the fifth angel poured his bowl on the throne of the beast, and his kingdom was plunged in darkness. Men gnawed their tugs in agony, but they only cursed the name of God who had the power to inflict such plagues, and they would not repent of what they had done. And the sixth angel poured his bowl on the great river Euphrates, and its water was dried up to prepare the way for the kings from the east. Then I saw coming from the mouth of the beast, the mouth of the false prophet, and the mouth of the dragon, three foul spirits like frogs. These spirits were devils with the power to work miracles, and they were sent out to muster the kings for the great day of battle of God the sovereign Lord. That is the day when I come like a thief. Blessed is the man who stays awake and keeps on his clothes, so he will not have to go naked and ashamed for all to see. So they assembled the king at the place called it the kings at the place called in Hebrew Armageddon. And the seventh angel poured his bowl on the air. And from the sanctuary I heard a loud voice from the throne which said, It is over! And there came flashes of lightning and peals of thunder and a violent earthquake like none before it in human history so violent it was. And the great city was split in three and all the cities of the world fell in ruin and God did not forget Babylon the great but made her drink the cup which was filled with the fierce wine of his vengeance and every island vanished and there was not a mountain to be seen and huge hailstones weighing perhaps a hundredweight fell on men from the sky and they cursed God for that plague of hail, for that plague of hail was so severe. Then one of the seven angels that held the seven bulls came and spoke to me and said, come, and I will show you the great whore enthroned above the ocean. So in the spirit, he carried me away into the wilds, and there I saw a woman mounted on a scarlet beast, which had seven heads and ten horns, and was covered with blasphemous names. And the woman I saw was clothed in purple and scarlet, and bedizened with gold and jewels and pearls. And in her hand she held a gold cup full of obscenities and the foulness of her fornication, and written upon her forehead was a name with a secret meaning, Babylon the Great, the mother of whores and of every obscenity on earth. And the woman I saw was drunk with the blood of God's people and with the blood of those who had borne their testimony to Jesus. And as I looked at her, I was greatly astounded. But the angel said to me, why are you so astounded? I will tell you the secret of the woman and of the beast she rides with the seven heads and ten horns. The beast you've seen is he who once was alive and is alive no longer and has yet to ascend out of the abyss before going to perdition. Those on earth whose names have not been inscribed in the Lamb's role of the living ever since the world began, all will be astonished to see the beast. For he once was alive and is alive no longer and has yet to appear. But here's a clue for those who can interpret it. The seven heads represent seven hills on which the woman sits. They represent also seven kings, of whom five have already fallen, one is now reigning, and one is yet to come. And when he does come, he's only to last for a short while. As for the beast you've seen who once was alive and is alive no longer, he is an eighth, and yet he is one of the seven, and he is going to perdition. The ten horns are ten kings who have not yet begun to reign, but who for one hour will share with the beast the exercise of royal authority. But they have but a single purpose among them, and will confer their power and authority upon the lamb, upon the beast, excuse me. They will wage war upon the lamb, but the lamb will defeat them, for he is Lord of lords and King of kings, and his victory will be shared by his followers, called and chosen and faithful. The ocean you saw where the great horse sat is an ocean of peoples and populations, languages and nations. The ten horns together with the beast will come to hate the whore. They will strip her naked and leave her desolate. They will batten on her flesh and burn her to ashes. For God has put it into their heads to carry out his purpose by making common cause and conferring their sovereignty upon the beast until all that God has spoken has been fulfilled. The woman you have seen is the great city that holds sway over the kings of the earth. After this, I looked, I saw another mighty angel coming down out of heaven from God. He came with great authority, and the earth was lit up with his splendor. And in a mighty voice, he proclaimed aloud, Fallen! Fallen is Babylon the great! 
She has become a dwelling place for demons, a haunt for every unclean spirit, for every vile and loathsome bird. For all nations have drunk deep of the fierce wine of her fornication. The kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and merchants the world over have grown rich on her bloated wealth. Then I heard another voice from heaven which said, Come out of her, my people, lest you take part in her sins and share in her plagues. For her sins are piled high as heaven, and God has not forgotten her crimes. Pay her back in her own coin. Repay her twice over for her deeds. Double for her the strength of the potions she mixed. Meet out grief and torment to match her voluptuous pomp. She says in her heart, I'm a queen on my throne, no mourning for me. No widow's weeds because of this. Her plague shall strike her in a single day. Pestilence, bereavement, famine and burning. For mighty is the Lord God who has pronounced her doom. The kings of the earth who committed fornication with her and wallowed in her luxury will weep and wail as they see the smoke from her conflagration. They will stand at a distance for whores or torment, weeping and mourning and saying, alas, 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 for the great city, the mighty city of Babylon, in a single hour your doom is struck, and the merchants of the earth also weep and mourn for her, for no one any longer buys their cargoes, cargoes of gold and silver, jewels and pearls, cloths of purple and scarlet, silks and fine linens, all sort of scented woods, ivory, all kinds of things made of costly woods, iron, bronze and marble, cinnamon and spice, incense, perfume and frankincense, wine, oil, flour and wheat, sheep and cattle, horses, chariots, slaves, and the lives of men. The fruit you long for, they will say, is gone from you, all the glory and glamour and loss never to be yours again. The traders and all these wares who gain their wealth from her will stand at a distance for horror to torment, weeping and wailing and saying, Alas, alas for the great city, which was clothed in purple and scarlet and bedizened with gold and jewels and pearls. Alas, and in a single hour, so much wealth should be laid waste. And all the sea captains and voyagers, the sailors and those that traded by sea will cry out as they see the smoke from her conflagration. Was there ever a city like the great city? They threw dust on their heads, weeping and wailing and saying, alas, oh, alas for the great city where all who had ships at sea grew rich on her wealth. Alas, in a single hour, she should be laid waste. But, let heaven exult over her. Exult, apostles and prophets and people of God, for in the judgment against her, he has vindicated your cause. And I saw a mighty angel take up a stone, like a great millstone. He hurled it into the sea and said, Thus shall Babylon the, Babylon the great beast sent hurtling down, never to be seen again. No more shall the sound of harpers and minstrels, of flute players and trumpeters be heard in you. No more shall craftsmen of any trade be found in you. No more shall the sound of the mill be heard in you. No more shall the light of the lamp be seen in you. No more shall the bride and bri voice of the bride and bridegroom be heard in you. For your traders were once merchant princes of the world, and with your sorcery you deceived all nations for the blood of God's people and of God's prophets was found in her the blood of all who had been done to death on earth and I heard what sounded like the roar of a vast throng in heaven and they were shouting hallelujah victory and glory and power belong to our God for true and just his judgments he has condemned the great whore who corrupted the earth with her fornication and has avenged upon her the blood of his servants. And once more they shouted, Amen, Hallelujah. Then I heard a voice in the throne which said, Praise our God, all you his servants, you that fear him both great and small. And once again I heard what sounded, excuse me, I skipped a verse. Let me drop back one, excuse me. And then I, the, the four living creatures and the 24 elders seated on their throne before God fell on their faces and worshiped God as he sat on his throne. And they too cried, amen, hallelujah. And then I heard a voice from the throne which said, praise our God, all you his servants, you that fear him, both great and small. And once again, I heard what sounded like the roar of a vast throng in heaven, like the noise of rushing water and the deep roar of thunder. And they were shouting, hallelujah, the Lord our God, sovereign over all, has entered upon his reign. Exult and shout for joy and pay him homage for the wedding day of the Lamb has come. His bride has made herself ready and for her dress she's been given fine linen, clean and shining. Now the fine linen signifies the righteous deeds of God's people. Then the angel who spoke to me said, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. Then he added, these are the very words of God. 
Well, at this I fell at his feet to worship him, but he said to me, no, not that, for I'm but a fellow servant with you and your brothers who bear their testimony to Jesus. It is God you must worship. Then he said to me, the testimony to Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And after this I looked, I saw heaven wide open. And there before me was a white horse whose rider's name was Faithful and True. For he is just in judgments and just in war. And on his head were many diadems, and his eyes flamed like fire. Written upon his forehead was a name whose meaning was known to none but himself. And he was robed in a garment drenched in blood. He was called the Word of God. And the armies of heaven followed after him on white horses, clothed in fine linen, clean and shining. And from his mouth there went a sharp sword with which to smite the nations. For he it is who shall rule them with an iron rod, and tread the winepress of the wrath and retribution of God the sovereign Lord. And upon his robe and upon his thigh there was written the name, King of kings and Lord of lords. And I saw an angel standing in the sun, calling aloud to all the birds flying in mid heaven, come and gather for God's great supper to eat the flesh of kings and commanders and fighting men, the flesh of horses and their riders, the flesh of all men, great and small, rich and poor, slave and free. Then I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies mustered to do battle with the rider and his army. And the beast was taken prisoner, and so was the false prophet who had worked miracles in its presence and had deluded the inhabitants of the earth who worshipped the beast in its image and wore the mark of the beast. These two were thrown alive into the lake of fire with its sulfurous flames, while the rest were killed by the sword which went from the rider's mouth, and all the birds gorged themselves on their flesh. Then I saw another angel coming down out of heaven from God with the key of the shaft of the abyss and a great chain in his hands. And he seized the dragon, that serpent of old, whose name is Satan or the devil, and chained him up for a thousand years. He threw him into the abyss, shutting and sealing it over him so he might seduce the nations no more till the thousand years are over. After that, he must be let loose for a short while. Then I saw thrones, and upon them sat those, those to whom judgment was committed. I saw the souls of all those who had been beheaded for the sake of God's word and for their testimony to Jesus. Those who had not worshipped the beast in its image and had not received its mark on right hand or forehead. These came to life again and reigned with Christ for a thousand years, though the rest of the dead did not come to life again until the thousand years are over. This is the first resurrection. Blessed indeed in one of God's own people, a man is the man who shares in this first resurrection. Upon such the second death has no claim, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him for a thousand years. When the thousand years are over, Satan will be let loose from his dungeon and come out to seduce the nations in the four corners of the earth and muster them for battle. Yes, the hosts of Gog and Magog, countless as the sands of the sea. So they marched over the breadth of the land and laid siege to the camp of God's people and to the city that he loves. But fire came down on them from heaven and consumed them. And the devil that seduced her was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur, where also the beast and the false prophet had been flung, there to be tormented day and night forever. And I saw a great white throne and the one who sat upon it. From his presence, heaven and earth vanished away, and there was no place left for them. And I saw the dead, both great and small, standing before the throne. Then books were opened, and then another book was opened the role of the living. From what was written in these books, the dead were judged, each one upon the record of its deeds. Then the sea gave up the dead in its keeping. Death and Hades gave up the dead in their keeping. They were judged, each one upon the record of his deeds. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This lake of fire is the second death, and into it are thrown any whose names are not to be found in the Lamb's role of the living. And I saw a new heaven. And a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had vanished away, and there was no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city of Jerusalem, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready like a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a voice from the throne proclaiming aloud, Now at last, God has this dwelling among men. He shall dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be with them. And he shall wipe away every tear from their eyes. And there shall be an end to death and to mourning and crying and pain for the old order is passed away. And he who sat on the throne said, behold, I am making all things new. Then he said to me, write this, for these words are trustworthy and true indeed. They are already fulfilled. 
I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. A draft from the water springs of life will be my free gift to the thirsty. All this is a victor's heritage, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, and the vile, murderers, fornicators, sorcerers, idolaters, and liars of every kind, their lot shall be the second death in the lake that burns with sulfurous flame. Then one of the seven angels that held the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues came and spoke to me and said, come, and I will show you the bride, the wife of the lamb. So in the spirit, he carried me away to a great high mountain. And there I saw the holy city of Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God. Oh, it shone with the glory of God and had the radiance of some priceless jewel, like a jasper, clear as crystal. The city had a great high wall, which had 12 gates, at which were 12 angels, and upon the gates were inscribed the names of the 12 tribes of Israel. There were three gates to the east, three to the north, three to the south, and three to the west. The city wall had 12 foundation stones, and upon them were the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. The angel that spoke to me carried a gold measuring rod with which to measure the city, its wall, and its gates. And the city was built as a square and was as wide as it was long, and it measured by his rod 12 thousand furlongs, its length, breadth, and height being equal. The city wall was 144 cubits high, that is in human measurements, which the angel was using, and the wall was built of jasper, while the city itself was of pure gold, bright as clear glass. The foundation stones of the city wall were adorned with jewels of every kind. The first, the foundation stones being jasper, the second, lapis lazuli, the third, chalcedony, the fourth, emerald, the fifth, sardonyx, the sixth, cornelian, the seventh, chrysolite, the eighth, beryl, the ninth, topaz, the tenth, chrysoprase, the eleventh, turquoise, and the twelfth, amethyst. The twelve gates were made from twelve pearls, each gate being made from a single pearl, and the streets of the city were of pure gold like translucent glass. And I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the sovereign Lord God and the Lamb. Nor did they have need of sun or moon to shine upon it, for the glory of God gave it light, and its lamp was the Lamb. And by its light shall the nations walk, and the kings of the earth shall bring into it the city all their splendor. And the gates of the city will never be shut by day, and there will be no night. And all the wealth and splendor of the nations shall be brought into it. But no unclean thing shall enter, nor anyone whose ways are false or foul, but only those whose names are inscribed in the Lamb's roll of the living. And the angel showed me the river of the water of life, sparkling like crystal, flowing from the throne of God and the Lamb down the middle of the city street. And on either side of the, the river stood a tree of life, which shows 12 crops of fruit, one for each month of the year. And the leaves of the trees serve for the healing of the nations. And every accursed thing shall disappear. And the throne of God and the Lamb will be there. His servants shall worship him. They shall see him face to face and bear his name on their foreheads. And there shall be an end tonight. Nor will they have need of lamp or sun, for the Lord God will give them light. And they shall reign forevermore. The angel said to me, write this, for these words are trustworthy and true. The Lord God who inspires the prophets has shown his, sent his angel to show his servants what must shortly happen. And remember, yes. I am coming soon. Blessed is a man who heeds the words contained in this book of prophecy. It is I, John, who heard these things. And when I had heard and seen them, I fell in worship at the feet of the angel who had shown them to me. But he said to me, no, not that. For I am but a fellow servant with you and your brothers, the prophets, and those who heed the words of prophecy contained in this book. It is God you must worship. Then he said to me, do not seal up the words of prophecy contained in this book, for the hour of fulfillment is near. Meanwhile, let the evil doer go on doing evil, and the filthy-minded wallow in his filth. But let the good man persevere in his goodness, and let the dedicated man be true to his dedication. I am coming soon and bringing my recompense with me to wreck with everyone according to his deeds. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to you with this testimony for the churches. I am the scion and offspring of David, the bright morning star. Blessed is the man who washes his robes clean. He shall enter by the gates of the city and have a share in the tree of life. Outside are dogs, 
murderers, fornicators, sorcerers, idolaters, and all who love and practice deceit. Come, say the Spirit and the Bride. Come, let each hearer reply. Come forward, you who are thirsty. Accept the water of life, a free gift to all who desire it. For my part, I give this warning to everyone who is listening to the words contained in this book of prophecy. Should anyone take away from the words of prophecy contained in this book, God will take away from him his share in the holy city and the tree of life described in this book. He who gives this testimony speaks. Yes, I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. May the grace of the Lord Jesus be with you all. Amen. Cool. Give it up for Jason. Thank you, Jason. <laughs> I don't really want to say anything. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, sit down. Um, thank you so much for coming. It means so much to us uh, that you're here because that means you care so much about this project. And, um, and thank you for that. Uh, that was amazing. It was a privilege to, uh, to listen to the book, mm -hmm. read aloud. Um, and that, that's it. That's really it for tonight. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to be hanging out, so come say hi. Um, oh, and then, but you're well, going to do a prayer, and I'm going to sit down when you do that. That's I wanna, true. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I thought it would be good, just one thing. One of the most common questions uh, that we get is what are you going to do when you finish the books of the Bible? Oh, yeah. And we finished the books of the Bible. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, but, we're, but we're not done. Um, we, we feel like uh, the, the Spirit's opening up more opportunity than when we thought possible when this project began. So you probably saw uh, the video we put out earlier this week about all the projects uh, that we want to get out there. But... Um, uh, the, the scriptures are a living, spirit-empowered word that change people when it encounters them. Amen? And we experience that tonight. And um, we feel so privileged to be able to be a part of helping uh, give an, create a new conduit for the spirit to bring the scriptures alive to people all over the planet through YouTube. <laughs> and so... Um, will be done when we feel like God tells us that it's going to be done. Uh, but the continuing support of you all and people around the world, uh, it's made it clear to us that we need to keep, keep at it. So that's what we're going to do until... Uh, and so thank you so much, really, your presence here and of 1,300 people around the planet. Yeah, I think there was <laughs> 2,000 when it was Sheesh. actually got going. Yeah, so, so awesome. holy... What's happening? Yeah. So anyway, thank you guys. This is a very special thing that we're all a part of together. Thank you for joining the Bible Project. Absolutely. Uh, um, yeah. That's it. That's what I okay. want to say. Cool. All right. I'm Can I close you. us in a prayer? Yeah, great. Um, uh, when I started learning Hebrew um, 17 years ago, uh, I uh, would attend a Messianic Jewish congregation uh, in Vancouver, Washington with a, with a friend. And um, I heard uh, a rabbi uh, sing the blessing of Aaron. Uh, from Numbers chapter 6 over uh, the community. And I was just like, I must learn that <laughs> and learn how to do that. And so that's uh, what I'd like to pray uh, over us as a community around the Bible Project, uh, you around the world who are watching and supporting. Um, this is a, one of the oldest living active prayers uh, in human history that has a continuous heritage reaching back over three millennia. Uh, it's a prayer uh, from Book of Numbers, Chapter 6. 
Ivarecha Adonai vayishmerecha Ya'er Adonai panavelecha v'chunecha Yisa Adonai panavelecha v'yasem lecha Shalom. May the Lord bless you and may he keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and may he show you his favor. May the Lord lift his countenance towards you and may he give you peace, shalom, abundance and wholeness. Lord Jesus, uh, we are so grateful for the gift of your word to us. Uh, we ask that you would continue to empower through your spirit uh, your word that has the potential to heal and transform and liberate and confront people around the world. Thank you for this, this project, this thing you're doing in our midst that we are all behind and excited to participate in. Um, we anticipate the coming of your kingdom. May your will be done, and may your kingdom come here on earth as in heaven. And all God's people said, amen. amen. Thank you, guys. Thanks for coming. Have a good night. <laughs>